Hello, welcome to the Spotlight. I'm Kaba Tafway. Many EU countries have announced their intention to increase their military spending. Such increases are estimated to be around 200 billion euros for the next few years. It's under an initiative called the European Defense Investment Program, which the EU has said is to deepen cooperation between EU countries as well as with their NATO partners. Why not come up with a program that will help their citizens who are suffering from high energy costs and incomes that can't keep up with inflation? Just a few of the angles we'll be looking at in this edition of the Spotlight. In just the past nine months, the EU and US have together pumped 32 billion euro worth of lethal weapons into Ukraine. At a meeting here in Brussels on Tuesday, EU defence ministers agreed to increase their military spending by a huge amount between now and the end of 2025. 70 billion euros. Apparently, there is an urgent need to replace weapons being sent to Ukraine. The supply of arms to Ukraine, it's a continuous flow. It flows every day. And every day there is a member state who provides more. The system has already been provided. I don't think we need new systems. What they need is ammunition to make the systems work. One expert we interviewed online told us it is a dangerous policy. The problem with further funding is that it suggests further escalation. An escalation is hazardous because by intent or by miscalculation, it can lead all of the parties into a nuclear conflict. Many peace activists and rights groups say the military spending is grotesque given the EU's growing social crisis. Those in the European Parliament who oppose NATO and are calling for peace talks between Russia and Ukraine are furious at attempts to silence them. We talk about democracy, but where is this going to end up? Those you brand as populist and anti-European have a democratic right to disagree with you on the course that Europe is taking. Defence ministers have agreed to establish camps in up to 20 EU nations that will be used to train Ukrainian soldiers. Some security analysts are suggesting long-standing controversial ambitions to create an EU army within the EU have effectively been put on hold. And now the strategy is to create an EU army in Ukraine. Jerome Hughes, Press TV, Brussels. Let me introduce our guest for this edition of the Spotlight. Don DeBar joins us. He's an activist and commentator who joins us from Ossining in New York. Also joining us, John Bosnich, journalist, activist, and political analyst, who joins us from Novi Sad in Serbia. Welcome to you both. John Bosnich, first over to you. So we had a correspondent there uh, in his report talk about how in the past nine months, the EU and the U.S. have pumped out uh, 32 billion euros worth of lethal weapons into Ukraine. I'm guessing that's a very conservative figure because the figures actually point to a lot higher than that figure. Uh, but the point of the program is why do they keep increasing their military budget, of which the EU seems to think that that should be a necessity. Uh, what, what, why do you think uh, the focus from the EU especially is so much to increase their spending? Well, this is a good opportunity for the military industrial complex to make a real killing, not just in terms of on the battlefield, but financially. By increasing the amount of weapons that they can deliver to the battlefield in Ukraine, they're going to turn over the biggest profit in modern history in the military industrial complex of the United States. That's the real aim here. Well, uh, digging deeper, Don DeBar, when we take a look at what uh, is going on, there's a uh, program of which uh, the EU is not only uh, to have contemplated, but is now is in its execution stage where the increases in military spending is said to be, and I'm quoting this from the EU uh, uh, source, that it's estimated to be at around 200 billion euros for the next few years. It wouldn't say how many years, it just said few. That's an awful lot, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, John's right on the one hand. The problem is you have these things that are sort of like dual purpose, means and end. It's like a self-financing casino. <laughs> um, you, you pay yourself a lot of taxpayers' money to build weapons. You take the weapons and you go steal somebody else's stuff. 
as things get blown up, you steal the money that you have in your banks of the people on the other end who you're bombing, and you apply that to this mega thing, whatever the hell it is, also, and just and it just feeds. It feeds. And um, in, in essence, it is uh, the deepening of exploitation of all of the world, of the resources of the world, by the elite that has been doing that in Europe and the United States for centuries now. Um, it's globalized. When they were talking about building a global order, we're seeing sort of the tail end of it. The parts that they have not absorbed and eaten and digested yet, they're making a grab for now. They're reaching across the table. So they stole your fork and they picked your pocket while they did it. Um, and they're going to use it to whip the steak off of your plate, and they're going to eat that, and then your plate, and then you. That's the game. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, th th this is what's interesting, John Bosnich. Maybe you can explain this to us. So on the one hand, you have uh, uh, the NATO, who has a budget where it commits a minimum of 2%, or asks uh, the member countries to contribute a minimum of 2% of their gross domestic product to what they call defense spending. We call it military spending. And then they say the purpose is to ensure the alliance's military readiness. Okay, so you have that, and then you have the EU now, who are now committed to, what, $200 billion in uh, the name of the program, which uh, is a little bit down the list here. So uh, am I to understand, or are we to understand that EU has to contribute to their own military spending and to the NATO military spending? Well, this is this is the the intent here is not just to get the EU to contribute. The intent is also to indebt the country of Ukraine and to <coughs> charge interest on that debt. So this involves not just the military industrial complex, but it also in, involves the banking industry of the West, which is going to get the Ukrainian people, no matter what happens in this conflict, to pay back all of this money plus interest. So we have a combination of the worst elements of the Western world, which are the military industrial complex and the people that are commonly called in America, the banksters. These two combined are going to crush the Ukrainian people, regardless of what happens on the battlefield. Well, I mean, uh, crushing the Ukrainian people is uh, one thing. What you said obviously makes sense. But Don DeBar, when you take a look at the GDP of NATO, I was shocked to see the figure. I had to double check it, but it seems to be accurate. $32.4 trillion, the total GDP of NATO nations. That equals 45% well, of the world economy. So my question is, well, this can go to better use, can't it? Especially when you talk about the EU, for example. I mean, if you, uh, what, I could show you a snapshot of a guy in Germany who's uh, breaking down lumber for a cold winter. Yeah, yeah. across Europe. But the, the guy in Germany is lucky that there's wood to, uh, you know, to work on. Some people where there's not, you know, you don't have as much, uh, you don't have any forest left or whatever. There's nothing to burn but the furniture. Um, the problem is, uh, first of all, Europe is sort of a repository, as is the U.S., but but Europe particularly, uh, for wealth that was accumulated, basically stolen from around the world. It's one of the wealthiest pieces of real estate on the planet. Um, that wealth is held uh, generally in private hands, although there is a good amount of it that's been socialized. Um, and you can see that in the infrastructure and the expectations generally of the population there that have you know, sort of been fed over the years, over the centuries even. Um, the idea that Europe would have its own military again has been floated on and off for a number of years. And depending on uh, the, the administrations in the United States lately, uh, there's actually been, uh, you know, a shift in opinion back and forth uh, by the U.S. On, on how that should happen. Trump, as you'll recall, was not so uh, up on, on NATO, had mentioned that perhaps it was obsolete, uh, then mentioned that uh, certainly uh, countries like Germany that had uh, such a high GDP and, uh, you know, and per uh, capita, uh, you know, were wealthy, uh, shouldn't be subsidized in uh, terms of their own uh, militaries by U.S. taxpayers. Um, of course, the people in Europe for the last 45 years now, maybe longer, have been suffering austerity imposed by their governments. Um, and, uh, and this has been aggregating over, over the, uh, the four or five decades. And so the imposition 
of an additional tax on them for this your own share of NATO expense uh, without what's happened would have produced something like we're seeing in the capitals now where people are marching against NATO. They're marching against the war. They're marching against austerity and they're marching against the perception of their governments as being anti-democratic, that perception rising basically from the fact that their governments are doing one thing and they're demanding from their governments something else that they're not getting. So, uh, you know, we're looking at a situation that's not sustainable on its face as far as that goes. Um, and we're looking at a situation also in terms of the military uh, where we're starting to see a little element of chaos enter. Hungary, Turkey, and others are starting to, you know, break away from this monolith that people thought they, you know, that, but existed. What, what did you think about the protests uh, in Europe? I mean, uh, we, you know, it's covered here and there when it is covered, but it's just pinpoints to a country, let's say Italy, and it shows the protests, and then it gets mixed in with other news. But if you take a look in the past seven to ten days, Don DeBar, these protests are huge in numbers. Italy, Spain, um, you have uh, Germany, uh, you have, um, I think Hungary was one of them. There's a number of European countries, and they're large numbers. France, uh, yeah. are we, I mean, it kind of it kind of looks like, it. not kind of, it looks like it's sweeping European nations. Shouldn't the governments be worried? Well, um, I, I think that, uh, depend, well, it depends on why, why they would worry. In other words, should the governments uh, consider the possibility that they could be deposed? Um, and I say the possibility exists. We haven't really seen a full manifestation of the thing that's happened yet. You know, the price of, uh, of energy, you know, tripling or doubling or whatever, depending on where you are in Europe, uh, is one thing when you have to postpone your summer vacation or, you know, somehow tamp it down, driving somewhere instead of taking a, a airplane, whatever. It's quite another uh, when you are in your house freezing and you can't turn the heat on because it's been shut off or you can't afford to pay for the, the next payment to have heat. At that point in time, people's uh, concerns about this rise from, you know, political discomfort uh, to the level more of this is an existential threat that we have to remedy right away. And so I think as conditions deteriorate further in Europe, you're going to see what we're seeing right now as more or less the prototype of what's to come, real energy uh, pumped into that. And I think you'll see, if not revolutions, certainly some governmental turnovers that are not the usual, uh, well, labor's going to okay. come in or Tories or whatever mode, but rather something much more directed from below. Seven or eight months ago, I think nine months now, John Busnish, when this war with Ukraine started, the stats on the EU in terms of poverty was quite alarming. Again, a surprise. Over one-fifth, 22.5 percent of the EU population living in households with dependent children who are at risk of poverty. That's 73.7 million people that are at risk of poverty. Again, nine months uh, ago when we came into this war. And then you have this news about the EU spending so much money on their spending. We just talked about the protests with Don DeBar that are happening across a number of EU countries. Uh, what uh, can the governments, what are the governments missing in this picture? before the storm actually hits? Because as it looks like, the storm has already hit. Well, I think, first of all, we have to, we have to do away with the concept that the governments actually care about their people. The governments care about the people only when the people complain. And so far, the level of complaints has not been high enough to put any pressure on the governments to stop this because the governments basically control a media monopoly across the entire EU backed up by the American media monopoly controlled by the Washington government. So the people may protest, but the amount of coverage that those protests get on the mainstream media is restricted as much as the governments can get away with. What we're going to see, however, now as winter sets in, is that there's going to be a real decrease in the quality of living of people who cannot heat their homes, who cannot feed their families, and cannot survive at a level that is minimally acceptable to the majority of the people. Once you, once you hit that level, you're going to see a situation in which the protests, if they materialize as expected, cannot be controlled by the governments and especially around christmas time 
in the West, if people are protesting at Christmas, we're going to be seeing a series of events that we simply cannot imagine in, in the Western economies. Like and what? that is going to have a real effect. What do you mean, series of events? Like what? Well, if, if people are unable to have their Christmas holidays in the traditional fashion in most of Western Europe and in America, you're going to see the potential of people on Christmas Day out in the streets protesting. And that is something we have not seen in the Western world since the Vietnam War. Interesting. Okay. Uh, it's not that far away, is it? Well, uh, let's take a look at uh, statements what made by the EU Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Burrell, Don DeBart. And this happened uh, at a speech at the 2022 Ambassadors Conference in Brussels, October the 10th, not that far back. He said uh, that the U.S. is not a reliable partner for security and that Europe's security policy was based on the U.S. and NATO, that the EU had delegated our security to the United States. And he says that that's wrong. What would make him say that, do you think? Uh, you know, there are a lot of contradictions, um, both among the members of uh, NATO, uh, you know, the EU members, um, and also within those uh, member nations, political contradictions. The glaring contradiction, of course, that you have, you see reproduced across the scale. Uh, in Germany, he's one example, uh, and the uh, foreign minister, uh, Baerbeck, is another. Um, where they've, in essence, said, uh, you know, we know the German people were promised uh, that we would deal with this austerity thing, and we know that you're having a hard time, um, and we know that what we're doing now in the war with Ukraine is making it even worse, and we had promised to make it better, but we made a promise to Ukraine also, and that's the one we're going to keep. There's, in other words, a contradiction between the government officials and the people that is creating, uh, on behalf of the people, when energized by this sense of an actual fact of desperation, um, a condition that hasn't existed before, uh, that is going to hold out, basically, a very limited set of solutions, either to endure the situation until the people collapse, uh, or to throw off the government structures that are imposing this on them and, and remedying the problems they face. There, there, you know, there have been a variety of mechanisms for blowing air into the system in the face of these intrinsic contradictions that exist in the economies and the political economy of Europe and, and the United States and the, the Western countries in general, uh, from Keynesian economics to, you know, a variety of different uh, social programs and things, safety net, et cetera, that have all pretty much been exhausted and swept aside. Um, the need, meanwhile, for the monster to feed only has increased. Its appetite has increased, and uh, you, you know you come to a point where there's no solution within the existing set of rules. We have to throw the pieces off the game board uh -huh. and sit down and figure out where you are and start over. And I think, again, the two paths are either the people are going to collapse under the weight of their own impoverishment, or they're going to throw off the mechanisms that are imposing this on them that remedy the situation. And we're going to see that play out in a lot of places in Europe this winter, I'm convinced. Sure. Well, the, 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 the fact that uh, uh, Europe can make its mind up when it comes to the U.S. on the subject of military uh, um, operations and spending, John Bosnich, is, is alarming. I mean, the, on the one hand, you have Joseph Burrell that says the U.S. is not a reliable security partner. Um, but then he says the U.S. and the EU are closer than ever. However, that alliance is not ironclad and it could shift in the near future. What do you make of his, of the schism here, of the, of the contradiction, I should say? Well, well, I think that the man is suffering from a split personality. And uh, unfortunately, uh, he shouldn't be in political office if he's having that kind of a problem. First of all, the underground, the, the underlying most important point is that Europe, especially the EU, is a militarily occupied colony of the United States. All economic activity in Europe is dependent on the U.S. security blanket. And now when the U.S. has succeeded along with England in scuttling the economy of the EU, what we've got is a situation where the EU is just being used as cannon fodder for the United States. And I think that when you combine these factors, we're going to see a situation in not not just the people of the EU, 
but several of the governments of the EU may be reconsidering their membership in the EU and even their alliance with NATO. What has happened is NATO has provoked this war, the US State Department has provoked this conflict, and they've pushed the EU countries first into the fire. And the EU countries cannot be expected, especially countries like Poland, Hungary, and Romania, which are frontline countries on the front next to the war zone, cannot be expected to stand idly by while America pushes them forward and keeps itself far away from the conflict. This is the dangerous structural problem at hand today. Well, the U.S. is not happy when it hears about what's called this European Army or European military force, Don Bar. This is something that has come up uh, not just recently, it's uh, propped up years and years and years ago. And it uh, basically puts American officials in a state of, uh, of uh, I don't want to say panic, but worry, because they think that if uh, Europe gains its uh, strategic autonomy, so to speak, then it's not going to follow the U.S. Uh, in terms of any uh, foreign policy objectives that it, that it may have, um, which would run, obviously, to America's interests. Uh, are we looking at the Ukraine war as something that the U.S. is leading to make sure that EU is going to follow uh, U.S.'s lead here uh, so it could keep it subservient to it? Is that, is that what we're looking at? I think we begin with the point John made that's a very important point, which is a statement of fact, okay, that Europe, among other places, Korea, Japan, et cetera, is still militarily occupied by the United States and has been since 1945. Um, I think the answer to your question, the key to the answer to your question, is to take a look at Germany post-war when you had the four occupation zones, the UK, France, the U.S. and the USSR divided Germany into four parts. Um, and then, in violation of the agreements on how to operate going forward, the idea was to keep Germany split up into pieces so it couldn't make mischief anymore. And if Germany couldn't make mischief anymore, then Germany couldn't ally and or acquire other you know, powerful states okay. in Europe and make mischief on a global scale anymore. Sure. And so, in violation of that agreement within only a few years, UK, France, uh, and the US, with the UK and France pretty much being occupied by the US at this time sure. also, decided to merge their three into the Federal Republic of Germany, which became about uh, two to two and a half okay. uh, times in size and, and whatever, as Eastern Germany, right. and redeveloped it and Western Europe. Right. And the USSR is the only one that walked away. Okay after occupying Eastern Europe to protect itself from another invasion, walked away from its share of Germany in 1989, Thanks, the and then from those other states that now are part of NATO that have moved up to Russia's borders. The U.S. sees the example of the USSR having ended its military occupation as enabling others to fill the void, and the U.S. willingly did that. Thank you for that. And Thank obviously you. knows if it leaves Europe, that this European army would be a threat, perhaps. Instead, the way it is, European army would only All right. be an adjunct I got to unfortunately NATO. jump in, Don DeBar. I'm so sorry. We're just out of time. Uh, the activist and commentator from Austin. Thank you, Don DeBar. John Busnich, thank you. Journalist, activist, and political analyst from Serbia. With that, we come to an end for this edition of the Spotlight. When we cover Tatali, it's goodbye.